Hey folks. So in this video, I want to teach you the superpower that is bash scripting. And the superpower it is. It's one of those things that you can pick up really quickly, as you'll see here. I'm going to teach you virtually everything that you'll need to know to write any script that you'll ever write. And once you get in the habit of writing bash scripts, it's one of those things that is a real force multiplier. Things that you would do manually often and you just deal with are things that you can automate very easily in a matter of minutes and you'll never have to do manually again. So let's walk through it. So I've written a lot of bash scripts over the years. I've tried to gather all of the knowledge that I've gained and extract essentially everything that I know that you need to know to write virtually every script that I've written and none of the weird things that you're not going to need to know because there are weirdnesses in the language, but you really don't need to deal with them the majority of the time. So let's get right into it. It does build on a knowledge of the shell and how to actually use bash. So if you're not familiar with the command line and all that, I did put out a video a couple weeks ago that you can check out to refresh your knowledge or, or learn for the first time. Otherwise, let's check it out. So to create a bash script, it's just a file like anything else. Typically it'll have the .sh extension. So we've got this hello.sh here. So the first line should always be the shebang. It's a fun word, but what it is, is a way for you to tell your shell what interpreter to use for the script. So here we've got, and this is a comment, so it starts with a hash, and you do an exclamation point or a bang, and then you give it the path to your interpreter. In this case, we're using bash. A good practice is to use this user bin env and then pass in the argument of the interpreter, so in this case, bash. And what this env tool does is it'll check in your system where the correct location of bash is. And we'll talk about how the path works in a bit, but suffice it to say, this will make sure that it's running the correct instance of bash for your system. A common problem that you'll see is people do something like this, where it's hard-coded the path of bin bash, but that's not portable. Some systems, like mine for instance, like I don't have bash, in that path. And so if I try to run a script that has been bash declared, it's going to fail out instantly. So that's no good. So bash, you know, being a shell language is very command focused. And this is what makes it so easy to work with. Anything that you've run on your command line, you can run directly the same exact way inside of the script. So echo hello YouTube, you could do that in your command line. You can do that exactly the same here. You got your command space and your argument. It has access to all of the same things that you have in your system. So I can run G settings, which is a GNOME utility for setting things in the desktop manager. So you can set the color scheme, for instance. Again, you can also do things like uh, pipelines. So we can do this cube control command, which passes into the fuzzy finder, uh, aux some stuff, and eventually runs through and does a cube control describe against the pod. That's a long command. And that's something that now, by virtue of having a bash script, you don't ever need to remember how to write it out manually. You can just refer to the script. And that's the real power of this. You know, we've learned one feature, which is calling commands. And even with just that, even if there's nothing else, you can still get great value out of using this because you can take any series of commands that you'd run and now self enclose them into a single script. But there's a lot more to the language, so let's check it out. But first, if we go back to our simple example of just an echo statement, if we try to run the script, we're going to run into some problems. That's where we need to learn a little bit about permissions on Unix systems. So if we run this hello.sh script, and to run it, you give it the file path. We're doing dot slash because it's in the current directory. You're going to see this error, which says permission denied. If we run ls-l, we can see the permissions on this file. And this is going to be true for any type of Unix system. So if it's Linux or Mac, you're going to see this, where we have these file permissions set for the user, for the group, and for everyone else. In this case, we've got read and write permissions for the user, and we just have read permissions for the group and for everyone else. And that's why we have this error, because we don't have execute permissions. So to remedy this situation, we can run chmod, which is a command line utility that allows you to change the file permissions on a file. So here we have u plus x, which is saying, for the user, add the execute permissions for this given file. Then if we run ls-l again, you can see now for the user, they do have read, write, and execute, but the group and the others still don't. If you did want execute permissions for everyone, you could do just chmod plus x, 
but just following the principle of least privilege. It's always best to default to just doing the user and opening it up beyond that if needed. But with that in place, now we can run the script and it'll run as we'd expect. But everything so far has been static. One of the powers of actually using a language is you can parameterize things. So let's pull out the name YouTube into a variable. So a variable in bash isn't going to be defined with let or const or var or anything like that. It's just the name of the variable, in this case name, and then equals. And this is important. You can't have spaces around the equal sign here. So it has to be name equals YouTube. If you did try to do something like this, where you have spaces around the equal sign, because bash being a command first language, it's going to see this and think another is a command and you're passing an equal sign and universe as arguments. But of course, another isn't a command and that wasn't what we intended. So that's an error. To actually reference the variable, you just do dollar sign and then variable name. And that'll be able to print out just the same as we had before. If you do single quotes instead of double quotes, that doesn't do the variable expansion. And so that'll print out the literal characters, you know, dollar sign name, instead of expanding to the value of the variable. So watch out for that. There's also this format with the curly braces. So dollar sign curly braces variable. And we'll see that this has some nice properties. So you can add additional operations against it. Like if you put a hash in front of the variable name, instead of printing out the value of the variable, it's going to give you the length of the value. In this case, YouTube being seven characters, it prints out seven in the place of the variable. A common situation you'll have is you'll have a variable that is undefined and you're trying to reference it. But if it doesn't exist, well, you're going to get a blank slot. So instead, you can set this default value. And the syntax looks like this, where it's within the curly braces and you do variable name, colon, dash, and then the value. In this case, we have anonymous. So with name being equal to nothing, when it gets to this spot, it's going to see, okay, name is not set, so we'll use the default value. Though it's important to know with this particular version, if we do echo name after that, it's going to be blank again, because name is still empty. We just used the default value in that slot. However, if you want to also set that value to the default, you can use an equal sign instead. So now it'll print out anonymous as the name on line five there. Next up, let's take a look at the subshell. The subshell is something that you'll end up using a lot. So the way it works is like this. You've got a set of parentheses and within the parentheses, you'll have some operation. Let's take a look at an example. So if I was to run PWD to get my current directory, it'll print out that I'm in the bash directory. But then if I run a command in the subshell where I first CD to the parent directory and then run PWD, you can see I'm in the videos directory. But if I then run PWD again from the original shell, we're going to see we're still in the bash directory. And that's because the CD and any operation within that subshell was just in the context of that subshell. It didn't impact what's actually going on in my current shell. And that becomes very handy in many use cases. But most commonly, you're going to use it for command substitution, which looks like this, where you have a dollar sign and then parentheses. So you can run your command from within the subshell, and then you can use that anywhere that you'd use a value. Here we're using it in a variable assignment, and we can then use that value anywhere that we want. Here's a more interesting example where we're first fetching from an API a JSON response, and then we're using JQ to extract a value from that. And the way that these subshells work with this command substitution is it takes the final output. So image URL will just be the literal URL that we get from this JQ command. And then we can use that in the next step to curl from that URL. There's also this thing called process substitution where you're able to treat the output of a command like a file. So in this case, we're using the diff tool, which is expecting two different files to be passed in and using the less than and then parentheses syntax, you just run a command and the output of that is going to be treated as a file. So we're going to be comparing the difference between these two LS outputs as if they were files. There's also the arithmetic expansion. So we've got this dollar sign and then double parentheses. That's where you can actually run any mathematical operations. And it might be surprising to you if you've never tried, but if you run three plus four within the shell, it's going to say something like, in this case, three is not a command. And so it has to be within this block. In most bash scripts that you write, you're going to need some form of user input. 
And that often comes in the format of command line arguments. So for instance, in the script that I have here, where I'm merging a video file in an audio file into a single output, I'm calling the merge AV command. That's gonna be assigned to the zero variable. The first command line argument is gonna be the variable one, second one to two, and so on. So then from within the script, what I like to do, and I think this is a very good practice, is to create these intermediary variables. So I've got video input is equal to the variable one, audio input to two, and so on. And then you just use those to write your script. You could, if you wanted to, just directly use one, two, and three. But if you compare the clarity of the top and the bottom here, I think it's much clearer what those variables actually refer to in the top. Another big part of many scripts is gonna be conditional logic, and that's where if statements come in. So if statements, the actual structure is pretty simple. So it's if some condition is true, then do this top block, L if, so if some other condition is true, but not the first one, then this will be performed. Otherwise, we'll do this final one in the else, and we close it out with an fi, which is just reversed if. So all fairly conventional. If you're wondering why there's like a semicolon and then then on the same line, you could do it on separate lines if you wanted to. You could do if then like this. Personally, I think the second form here is kind of ugly. There is one element of bash that's a little bit strange. Again, being a shell first language, this is probably why this is the way that it is. But in other languages, like if you look at Python or JavaScript, there's a concept of truthiness where if you compare one is equal to one, the result is gonna be true. If you compare one to two, it's gonna be false. Well, that's not the way that it works in Bash. It uses exit codes where the exit code of zero is a success. An exit code of literally anything else, whether that be one, 10, 200, it doesn't matter. That's gonna be a failure. The specific number that an exit code has beyond just meaning that it's a failure doesn't generally mean anything. Now, a specific command or a specific script can choose specific numbers, and then you can do specific error handling based on that number. But most of the time, you'll just do something like this, where you've got an if block, you know, so if some condition, if something failed, then echo, you know, do your logging, but then exit one, and that's gonna say, all right, stop the program here, but we're returning to whoever kicked this off that this was, in fact, a failure. So what this means with this exit code approach is that you can run commands as your conditionals. So here we've got an example with grep where we're searching a logs.txt file for any occurrence of error. And if there's a match, that's gonna be a success. That'll return exit code zero. And then we're gonna do what's in the first block here. Otherwise, if there are no matches, it's going to return the else block. All is fine in the world. Now, it probably feels a little bit weird in this example because you'd think that well, if we have errors in our logs.txt, surely that's not a good thing. But you gotta remember it's in the context of grep trying to search for a match. The match itself is the success state. So that's why that is how it is. But most of the time, you don't need to worry about that. Most of the time you'll be doing conditionals. And bash has a lot of conditionals. So the built-in conditionals use this testing syntax, which has this double square brackets. And it kind of uses a command-like syntax where you need to have spaces around everything. If you have everything squished up, it's going to be a syntax error. So make sure there are spaces. Again, your editor should warn you about that. But we can see we have things like string comparisons that you're used to, like the double equals or not equals. But for numerical comparisons, you have to use these short codes of dash eq or dash ne and so on. We also have ones like this for variable existence. So you can do dash z to see if something is empty or dash n to see if it's not. You can do file checks to see if things exist. You can check what the permissions are, and you can also combine them. So you can do dash a or dash o for logical and or or. You can also do it externally with the double ampersand or the double pipe for the and or the or. My preference is to use the external because it makes more clarity in my mind as to where the separations are. You can do internal if you like as well. Okay, we've been talking language specifics for a little bit. I just want to show off a couple useful commands that you're going to want in a lot of scripts that you write. So first is sleep. You're probably familiar with this. You can just say how many seconds you want to sleep for. It's as simple as that. We'll see an example of this later on. There's also the read command for getting user input to write your script. So you can do something simple like this, where we're asking for the user's name, and the command is just read, and you can pass in the variable that you want to assign the output to. So if I run this script, what is your name? Give it my name, and then it'll use that as the variable that it's printing out. 
more often than not, the way that I use this is for approvals or input steps where something has happened and you want to make sure that the user wants to proceed from this point. And so you can do something like this where you say, do you want to continue? If they don't say yes, you can exit out. Probably want to have a little bit more nuance to it than this simple example. But this kind of idea is very common. Back to bash specifics. As I've mentioned before, bash is a strange language. And I want to talk a bit about the behavior and how we can make it a little bit more pleasant to work with. So if you're familiar with JavaScript or Perl, you might be aware that there's a strict mode with those languages. But the idea is you can make things a bit more strict so you're more likely to encounter errors to make your code better. There's this command that is often called the strict mode of bash, which is this set-euo pipe fail, which is a combination of these three commands that set some different behaviors. So let's walk through this just so we can understand what's going on. So if you don't have set-e, what happens is a very weird behavior. So the false command here is just going to be a failure. It should exit the program, or that's what you'd expect. But with bash, when something fails, the script just keeps on going, which is not good behavior. So that's what set-e resolves. If we run false again, the program will just exit immediately. It's not going to continue on to the next step. That's good because typically, in an imperative language, you're going to expect that everything is going to be building on top of each other. So if one thing has failed, you really don't want the next step to proceed because you're at that point expecting that the previous things have succeeded. So I would always use this. Uh, though, as an aside, there is a thing called conditional execution where you can say command one and then double ampersand command two, where it'll say if command one succeeds, then run command two. Or you can opt for if command one fails, then run command two. But if command one succeeds, then just skip command two altogether. These can be very handy in these situations where we, for whatever reason, couldn't use set-e. For a command like false, which will fail, we can use the or, the double pipe, and just say exit one. So if that fails, then we'll immediately exit the program, as we would expect. But better is to use set-e, and then in this case, if we have a command like false, which we know is going to fail, but we want the program to continue anyway, we can do this where we or that with true. And so if false encounters an issue, then we'll run true. And true is going to be a success, so it'll carry on. So without set dash u, you'll often encounter this problem where you reference a variable, like name in this case, where name was never actually defined. And the result is it'll just print nothing in that spot, but the script will continue on. But the reality is you probably, because you referenced it, you probably wanted name to exist. You were hoping that something was there. And so if you do set dash u, this will have it so it exits on the case of referencing something that's undefined at that point. So this will help you catch a lot of minor bugs where either you typed something or you thought that you declared something up above and you didn't, always good to have. And then set dash o pipe fail. We're gonna use set dash e with this to make this easier to understand. If you run something like false, which again fails, and then you have that as part of a pipeline where the next step runs and that succeeds, the false at the beginning, the failure, actually gets lost. And so even though we have set-e and the program should exit when something fails, it's going to continue on anyway because it saw that echo hello was a success. Whereas if we introduce the dash o pipe fail, it will detect that first error, the false, uh, where, where it fails, and then the script itself will exit. That's, again, much better behavior. You don't want to lose errors in a pipeline. So, in general, I would always add this set-euo pipe fail right below your shebang. All right, so at this point, we've actually covered probably 80% of everything that you're gonna need to know. But as I mentioned, there's a lot of the language that I've never even used and I've written a ton of bash scripts. So I'm gonna show you the things that you're likely to encounter at some point. Probably not in every script, but in some. So arrays, you know, sometimes you need to create a list of items. So in this case, I'm creating an array of numbers and the syntax, Honestly, a little bit confusing, because it looks like a subshell, but it's not. When you do the variable assignment with the parentheses here, each item, and it needs to be separated by spaces, but these are going to be separate items in the array. And then to access them, if you want to access a particular item in that array, you can use the index like this, where we have the square brackets and the index number. You can also refer to all the elements. If you're doing the square brackets, if you do the at sign, that's going to reference all of them, 
Or you could just leave off the square brackets and just do my array, and that would also work. And again, we can do other things like using the hash to print out the length of the array, so the number of items. We've also got for loops, which Bash actually has a surprisingly good variety of for loops here. So you've got a pretty standard one here where we've got a for item in my array. And so this will loop through each element from my array here. And you'll see the syntax here is do and done. So everything within that block will be done for each item. There we go. As expected, it just prints out the numbers. But it also has a C style version. So you can do the classic i equals zero, i is less than whatever, i plus plus. You can do things like that. A more compact version is with the range. So for i in and you can say i dot dot whatever number you want. So here's an interesting one where you can do pattern matching. So you can set a pattern like this where I'm looking at all of the markdown files within the content directory. We've also got command results. So you can run something like ls, which will return a list of items, and then we'll loop through each item in that output. So a pretty good variety there. Of course, there are also while loops. I don't find myself using these all that often, but the syntax is pretty straightforward. While condition, do, done. One little oddity here is, again, due to the weird way that math works in Bash, to increment the counter here, you need to do it in those double parentheses. But we get the same result as we'd expect. Now, the one use case that I do find myself using while loops for quite a bit is for what I call wait until true. So in this case, I'm going through an example where I deploy some application to a Kubernetes cluster and I wait until it's up into a running state. So we've got an infinite loop here, so while true, do the following. And so first, we'll save some status. So in this case, I'm getting the pod status in a subshell, and we're getting that output. It'll look something like starting up or running or whatever. In this case, I'm waiting until the status is equal to running. And as soon as that matches, I'm gonna break out of the infinite loop. Otherwise, we'll go to this else block and It'll print out some logging statement, and then it'll bring back that sleep that we talked about earlier. All right, another situation you'll encounter at some point if you're writing a long script is that things get a bit complicated to understand. You know, it's just not pleasant to work with. So you can break it out into multiple files. Now, it should be noted that Bash has no concept of namespacing or modules or anything like that. It's just separate files. And so here we've got a setup here where we've got this provisioner.sh, which we'll pretend is provisioning some new virtual machine, and then it's going to configure some DNS records and so on. So we've got an instance.sh, which will handle the provisioning of the virtual machine. We've got the DNS file that will actually update the DNS records, and the provisioner.sh will kick off each of those in their turn. So calling out to those different scripts, as we can see, is just like running any other command, except we're doing it as a relative path rather than a command. But just like anything else from the command line, we can pass in arguments, right? So we could, in each of these scripts, have the relevant variables for those, like the region and the size for the instance and the domain name for the DNS. But there are two ways of actually doing this. So you can source a shell script or you can kick it off, execute it in a subshell. So sourcing is kind of interesting where it's going to operate in the same shell. So here's an example of how this works. So if I set my favorite color is equal to green, and then I echo that, we can see the output is green. Then I source it using this dot, and then the script uh, with the space in between there. That's saying source this script. That will load it up, and so now when we echo favorite color, it's still green. Then if I set favorite color to blue, and then echo that, we get blue. But then back in script one, if I echo favorite color, we get blue. And that's because if we think about how the source will work, it's effectively taking all the contents of script two and just dumping them in line into script one, exactly where the call to script two is. So that means that we're using the same shell, all the variables are the same, and it's all just a way of breaking things out. So it makes it easy to carry on all the continuity with everything without having to pass around values. So in some cases, this is quite handy. The other way is the subshell, where if we do favorite colors green, once I call it to script two, Without using the source, this is just executing the script. This now spins up in a subshell, and when it runs echo favorite color, it actually has no idea what favorite color is because it hasn't been declared yet. And if we had set dash u set, it would have exited the program because it would say, hey, we have no idea what this is. But once I declare favorite color is blue and print that, it's cool with that. And then back to script one, favorite color, as far as it's aware, is still green. So we can set those operate 
very differently. So the question is, which one should you be using? And it really comes down to both personal preference and the specific use case. I like to default to using the subshell version because I don't like to have all these implicit references everywhere. I would prefer to pass in exactly what a script needs. Just like with functions, you don't want to be referencing global variables. You really want to be passing in everything it needs, and so it's more self-enclosed. That being said, because the context of most scripts is very tightly coupled, you know, you're not trying to break stuff out to make it more reusable. You're doing it just so it's easier to comprehend. Sourcing can be just fine, and it'll save you from having to redeclare variables. But the choice is yours. You might notice that we haven't talked about functions yet, and pretty much every language that you use, you're going to be using functions a lot. So it's kind of strange to not have touched on it yet. But in truth, I really don't use functions at all in Bash, save for a few situations. And you'll see why in a second. Our function signature is function, and then the name, parentheses, and then we've got squiggly brackets. Absent, you might notice, is we don't have any arguments within the parentheses. That's one of the peculiarities of Bash. It's going to take in whatever's passed into the function, and then we can choose to do with it what we want. Now, do note that when we're looking at the one and two variables here, this is actually totally separate from the wider script. So you could have one and two at the global level, but the one and two here is scoped to within this function call. Confusingly, you'll notice that we've got the local tool and local install URLs here. That's because if we just declared the variables tool and install URL without specifying them as local, they would actually be declaring them globally, not locally to the function scope. So kind of confusing that that behavior between those two isn't consistent, but that's the way that it is. So just got to deal with it. But within the function, you can do whatever you want. You'll notice that the way that it works is very similar to a script. So when we call out to it, it's just like any other script or command. So we can say ensure dependency, passing in the arguments that we want, no parentheses, no nothing like that. And the reason that I don't end up using this a lot, save for instances like this, where I just have some small thing that I want to repeat over and over again, is because the types of things that you do in bash scripting tend to be relying on external tools. And so any shared logic would be already pre-built into that. Then in other languages, like let's say you're using Python, you really don't want to have a single function that does like 15 things. You're going to want to break those into separate functions, even if you're only going to use them once. But there isn't a huge amount of benefit to doing that within Bash. A quick little tip here is you might find yourself frequently, I know that I have when I'm doing infrastructure stuff where I'm creating files and want to clean them up later. There's this tool called make temp, where if you do that from within a subshell, it'll create a file inside of a temporary directory and then it'll reference that. So you can assign some new variable to whatever the output is. And then you can treat that just like any other file. You have no idea where this file actually exists. It's going to be likely in slash temp slash some random string. And because it's in the temp directory, it'll get cleaned up automatically at some point by your system. But you can do this in combination with this trap command, which will execute some given command. In this case, we're removing the temp file on a given signal. And the signal we're looking for is exit. So as soon as the script completes, we get the exit signal and this command will be run. The temp file will be cleaned up automatically. So I find that very helpful. And you can do the same thing for directories using make temp d and then you can do whatever you want inside of that temporary directory and you can know that as soon as the script is completed all of that will be wiped automatically another quick thing to discuss is the naming convention of the scripts themselves so do you do something like provisioner.sh or do you just call it provisioner and there's no strict rule around this but the way that i see it i like to do for anything that's like local to a project, I'm going to use the .sh, so it's very clear what this thing even is. We know that it's a script. But if I want it to be system-wide, like a command that would run from anywhere in the system, I'm just going to use provisioner in this case, not provisioner.sh. Because I don't care if provisioner is a script or if it's some binary or anything else, I just know that I want this to run. So that's how I look at it. When you're trying to treat things like commands, it's important to understand the path. So if I was to call a command, let's say we've got a command called blackout, which will set my machine to night mode, ordinarily you're going to call it with its file path. So if it's in the current directory, it'll look like this, where it's dot slash blackout. Um, you can also do absolute path. But if I call it just blackout, my shell is going to say, hey, I have no idea what that is. And the reason for that is blackout 
doesn't happen to be in the path. So what is the path? Well, the path is an environment variable that's set in your shell that lets it know exactly what directories to search in whenever it's looking for a command. So it'll look something like this where we've got a series of directories and they'll be separated by colons. And whenever you run a command, your shell will check across all of these directories and figure out you know, which one actually contains that particular command. And if that command doesn't happen to be found in any of those directories, we'll get that command not found error. So how do we remedy that? We've probably actually done this before many times. You might not have been aware of what it's doing, but there's this export path command that you'll run where you set the path to the current value of the path, and then you do colon, and then you add on whatever new directory you want. So I like to use a dot scripts directory that lives in the home directory, and I dump all my scripts in there. You can do wherever you want, but just remember that you need to export that um, in order to make them all accessible to your system. But once you've run that, now anywhere within that shell, you can run blackout. It doesn't matter if you're in the scripts directory or anywhere else, it'll run just fine. But that is only for the duration of that shell session. So make sure to add your export path command to your uh, shell's configuration file. So like your bash RC. So with that, we've covered everything that you need to know, but I'm gonna quickly walk you through the general process I go through whenever I create a new script. So first and foremost, you need to have some idea of what you're trying to do. Not really a point in writing a script if you don't know what you're trying to solve. But once you have that, then you identify what tool you want to use. The majority of what you're gonna be doing in your actual script is just gluing together all these powerful tools that are already purpose-built for some use case. And you're just trying to glue them into some particular pattern that solves your problem. So you figure out what tools you're gonna to be using, and then you sketch it out in the terminal. So you just do it manually, run the commands, and just play around until you figure out exactly what you want it to do. From there, you can then copy all those commands. You can use history to pull all those commands out, but grab them into a script. From there, you then parameterize it. So pull out anything that will change between different runs and then create command line arguments and all that. Add some checks. So if there are things that you need to make sure they're passed in or you gotta make sure that files exist and so on, you can add guard clauses and all of that. And I'd say that at that point, the majority of my scripts are done, but sometimes things need to get more complex and so you'll have more advanced logic. You might have loops, you might have functions, so you can add those in as necessary. But I generally like to have all of this starting in a single file. But then if things get too large, then I break it into multiple files. So quickly, if we take a look at this process with an example, the FFmpeg example, I know that I wanted to create a script that will merge a video file and an audio file into a single output. So I know that I'm gonna use FFmpeg for this, um, cause it's very good at that. And so I can sketch it out. I can run this ugly command to get it to work. But now that I have this, I'll just dump that directly into a script. But we can see it's hard coded with all these values like video.mp4. So I'll pull those out into variables and use command line arguments. So with that in place, things are pretty good. But let's add some checks. So I want to make sure that I actually have three command line arguments because this would fail if I only passed in two. So we'll print out a usage error and exit if not all that's set. But with that, we're done with the FMPEG example. You could add additional checks, like you could make sure that those files exist, but for simple things like this, I wouldn't bother. Another quick example. So I work a lot with Kubernetes, so I like to be able to spin up local Kubernetes clusters easily, and I want to install some apps in them. So the tools that I'm gonna use are Kind to provision the clusters, Keep Control to interact with the cluster, and Helm to install applications. So if I sketch it out, I'll run some commands like this, or I'll run kind to create the cluster. I'll run some Helm commands to add the repositories and to do the upgrade and install. And then at the end, I'll use keep control to port forward. Pretty simple example, but I can dump that into a script. And actually, as it stands, this could run just fine without any parameters or anything. But there are things that we could parameterize, like the cluster name. By doing this, now I can support multiple clusters at once but I can still default to using just the playground name if I want to. Then I can add some checks, right? I need to make sure that these tools are actually available on my machine. So kind, helm, and cube control. This is a point where I'd figure out that, hey, actually this is very repetitive and I could pull this into a function. Like we saw this function previously, it's ensure dependencies. And now I can 
reference those and I could, as I grow and include more tools, I can easily ensure that they're all available. And obviously the script could keep growing. It could do a lot more stuff. So the general process again is just do the stuff manually and then iterate. I think the worst thing you can do is try to write the entire script in one go and then only test it at the end. I think just due to the nice nature of working with a shell language, just like with Python or JavaScript where you can use the REPL to play around and try things out, because everything you write is the same as within the terminal, there's no reason to not try things out manually and then dump them into the script once they're working. All right, so I've covered a whole lot. There's more to the language, and there's this great site called LearnX in YMinutes.com. I'll link it down below, but they've got a great guide on Bash and pretty much any language um, that you should definitely check out. And that brings us to the end. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope that you go out there and write some Bash scripts that save you a bunch of time and that you now have superpowers that will impress others. As you can see, Bash is, you know, it's an awkward language in many ways, but it's very powerful just due to the nature of calling out to all these other commands. So thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.